Welcome back to this introductory statistics course. Today marks the final lecture and also the final session of our series on the general linear model. And today we're going to cover what is called repeated measures ANOVA. Now, at the core, this is still a general linear model and it will involve refreshing a lot of what you already know from previous weeks. But it's also your first time to encounter repeated measures and the first time you encounter any kind of method for dealing with nested data structures. So in a way this is complex and really understanding this material goes beyond the scope of this course. But in another way, it's a lot of repetition. So you're likely to be able to get the gist of this technique, even if you don't yet fully understand how it works. So let's get started with building your working knowledge of repeated measures ANOVA. We need this technique anytime we use what is called a within subjects research design. And within subjects designs means that the same group of participants are exposed to several treatments or are followed over time with repeated assessments of the outcome variable. So for example, you might imagine that your group of participants views several distinct stimuli or tries several different drugs. For example, they might first be on a placebo and then later receive your treatment, or they might first receive a treatment and then later receive a placebo. And each time they receive a different treatment, you measure the same outcome of interest. So you have one dependent variable measured multiple times. And this is what is known as a longitudinal design, a design that unfolds over time. So we see this kind of design anytime we're trying to assess the test retest reliability of a scale, or when we conduct longitudinal panel studies, for example, administering the same questionnaire to the same families year after year to track their children's development. We see this when we use daily diary studies where people are beeped on their smartphone to fill out a short questionnaire. And we see this when we conduct repeated physiological assessments, for example, EEG measures or fMRI measures, etc. Why would we ever use a within participants design? Well, the great thing about such a design is that there are no differences between your experimental groups on any control variables because they are the same participants. So many individual differences remain constant between the different stimuli. That means that any variability in the dependent variable that is due to individual differences is removed from the error term of your model. And because of that, the error term becomes smaller and that increases your power to detect an effect of the intervention. You can also think of this as every participant serving as their own control. We also obtain more information per participant, which means that our research design is more efficient. We can use a smaller sample to detect a significant difference than we could if we use a between participants design. Now that you've heard this, you might think, why don't we just always use a within participants design? But of course, there are also downsides. So one downside is that your participants might experience what are called order effects. The order in which the conditions are presented might have an effect on their reported outcomes. Even more problematically than order effects is that there might be differential order effects. The order effect might differ across different orders. For example, if you first give people an experimental drug and then a sugar pill placebo control, they are likely to notice that the sugar pill has no effect and they might report much more negatively than if they had first had the sugar pill, experienced its placebo effect, and then experienced an additional benefit from receiving the true drug. Of course, there are some solutions for dealing with order effects. We could try to control for them. And in order to control for them, we have to switch up the order between our participants. There are often many types of possible orders, and one way to deal with this is to use what's called a Latin square design. So you experimentally assign people to different orders of treatment, and then you can try to control for the effect of order. So in a Latin square, each condition appears in one position in the ordering. So here you see an example 
there are four measurement occasions and there are four treatments, A, B, C, and D. So you just mix up the order and each condition appears in only one position. So the first order would be A, B, C, D. The second would be B, C, D, A. The third would be C, D, A, B. And the fourth would be D, A, B, C. Now this is just one potential Latin square. If you think about combinatorics, there are many different Latin squares possible. Four times four conditions gives us 256 possible Latin square designs. And there are tools that will randomly generate a Latin square for you. So the important thing is that this will account for some of the order effects. And there are some other limitations of within participants designs aside from order effects. So for all within person designs, including non-experimental designs, there may be learning effects, which means that people become familiar with your questionnaire and this influences how they respond to it. There might be historical effects. For example, some event may happen during your study. A fire alarm could go off during one measurement occasion. A global pandemic might break out. So this happened to colleagues of mine who study adolescent development and they were conducting these multi-million euro longitudinal panel data collections. And then COVID happened, which must have influenced teenagers' development to a large extent. And that's a great example of a historical effect or there might be a documentary on TV about the topic of your study, which could also cause some kind of reactivity in your participants. Another limitation of within participants designs is that the effect of time is confounded with the effect of condition. And you see this, for example, in psychotherapy trials. So when people seek out a therapist, they are often feeling their worst. They've hit rock bottom and now they want treatment. If you then assign them to a different kind of therapy, then what you're likely to see is naturally occurring recovery, because if you hit rock bottom, you can only go up, and this will be confounded with the effectiveness of the treatment itself. And another limitation, which is specific to repeated measures ANOVA, is that the effect of time may not be random. There might be a specific functional form of the effect of time. For example, I was involved in a study on depression on military service members, and you could imagine that depression abruptly changes after people have been deployed. They are likely to get substantially more depressed after having seen the horrors of war, and then either increase or decrease over time. So here we have a really specific functional form where depression goes up after deployment and then decreases slightly or even increases. Now, if you do expect there to be a specific functional form of the effect of time, you can account for that using techniques known as structural equation modeling, but those are beyond the scope of this course. Now let's look at some applied examples with repeated measures, starting with a really simple example where there are just two measurements. And in this case, we collected data from 10 participants and each participant was measured twice once before an intervention, so that's a pre-test measurement, and once after the intervention, so that's a post-test measurement. And you see their data in this table. So for example, respondent number one had a pre-test score of two and a post-test score of five, so they went up. And then here, respondent number nine had a pre-test score of 10 and a post-test score of nine, so they went down. And we could calculate the mean for both of these time points. So the mean score at pretest was 6.5 and the mean score at post-test was 8.5. So how can we analyze these data? Hopefully it's obvious to you that we have a problem, which is that the data violate the assumption of independence of errors of our general linear model. So because one participant gives us two data points, the error of those two data points will be correlated, right? Because for the same person, some of the same factors are likely to influence the error term. So we can't really use linear regression or any of its other interfaces like the independent samples t-test. But what we can do is conduct what is called a paired samples t-test. So the solution to this problem with just two repeated measures is to use a paired samples t-test. And I'm not even introducing a radically new technique to you because how does a paired samples t-test work? 
Well, it's just calculating the difference between the two measurements for every person and then performing a one sample t-test on the difference score. What you could also do to replicate this is just perform a linear regression with a different score as outcome and only an intercept as the predictor. So the paired samples t-test is nothing new. It's just taking the two columns for pre and post test, calculating a third column, which represents the difference between those two scores, and then either performing a one sample t-test on that different score or conducting a regression model with only an intercept. So let's look at what happens when we calculate the different score post minus pre. As I mentioned before, the score of person one went up from two to five. So if we do post minus pre, then we get a difference of plus three points. And for person number nine, they started with a score of 10 and they went down to a score of nine. So if we do post minus pre, we get minus one different score. And we can also look at the mean value of this different score and across all 10 participants, the mean value of the difference was 1.7. If we use the paired samples t-test interface to perform our test, we see that it calculates t1 minus t2, so exactly the opposite of what I did, and they get a score of minus 1.7, so that makes sense because we saw 1.7 when doing t2 minus t1. It also gives us a standard error for that value, a confidence interval, and a t-statistic. So the t-statistic is minus 3.6 on 9 degrees of freedom, and that's going to give us a significant p-value. Like I said, we can also do this using a regression model with only the intercept and the different score as outcome. So that's what I did here. I calculated the different score and I included an intercept, and we see that the effect of the intercept is 1.7, with the same standard error as here and the same p-value as well. Which shows you that both of those interfaces give completely identical results. So if we have only two measurements, it's really simple, just analyze the difference score. But what if we have more than two measurements? So let's consider the following example. I've analyzed some data on 978 Dutch military personnel who have been deployed and we collected four repeated measures of their depression symptoms using the SCL checklist. We had one pre-deployment measure and then three measures after deployment every six months. So here we have more than three repeated measures and our research question could be, is there a difference between the mean value on those repeated measurement occasions? And our null hypothesis is that the mean value on all four measurement occasions is equal. And our alternative hypothesis is not the null hypothesis. So any of those means differ. We could take two approaches. One approach is called the univariate approach, and that is equivalent to a linear mixed model. This is just linear regression, and we treat the four repeated measures as a single outcome variable, which means that every participant has four rows of data. So we started with four columns for the four repeated measurement occasions, and we put them all below each other because they're all the same variable, but we account for the effect of time. And the second approach to analyzing such data is what's called the multivariate approach. Here we still treat the four measures as different outcomes, but we treat them as correlated outcomes. So we know that people's scores at time one, two, three, and four are going to be strongly correlated and we account for that correlation. So the univariate approach or the linear mixed model approach is most similar to what we've done in this course in all preceding lectures about the general linear model because it also uses linear regression. It treats all of the repeated measurements as a single variable with multiple observations per person. This is called converting the data to long format. So imagine that you have a data set with about a thousand military servicemen and four measurement occasions. So we start with four columns and then we put those four columns beneath each other. So instead of a thousand rows with four columns, we now have 4,000 rows with one column for the outcome and an additional column that indicates at which moment in time that row was collected. 
Keeping track of the measurement occasion that that data point came from allows us to include measurement moment as a control variable. So you can think of this just as any other factor variable. It's a discrete variable with four measurement occasions, time one, two, three, and four, and we can just include dummy variables to account for mean value differences in depression between those measurement occasions. But then we also have to account for differences between people, and this is what we call a random effect. Every participant may have their own person-specific mean around which their scores vary. So like I said, the great thing about this approach is that it is again an application of the general linear model, which by now you understand very well. But the downside is that this method assumes what's called sphericity. So if that assumption of sphericity is violated, then the linear mix model is not a good approach. So what is this assumption of sphericity? Well, sphericity means that the variances of the differences between all combinations of repeated measures are all equal. So if we calculated different scores, then the variance of those different scores should be the same regardless of which two time points we subtracted from each other. And for now, the easiest way for you to understand this is that sphericity is kind of a generalization of the homoscedasticity assumption that we've assumed until now. The sphericity is closely related to the notion of compound symmetry. And that means that all repeated measures have equal variance. So the variance at time one is the same as the variance at time two, time three, and time four. And each pair of repeated measures have the same correlation. So for example, the correlation between time one and time two could be 0.6 but then the correlation between time three and time four should also be 0.6, and between time one and time four should also be 0.6. And perhaps you already see how making all of these assumptions allows us to treat those multiple repeated measures as a single long format dependent variable. But sometimes we'll have evidence to doubt the assumption of sphericity. And in this case, we can always fall back on the multivariate approach. So if we can't or do not want to assume sphericity, then we can use the multivariate approach, which treats the repeated measures as covariates of one another. So when we look at the effect on time one, we control for the score at time two, time three, and time four. And when we look at the effect on time two, we control for the score at time one, time three, and time four, etc. So because we include so many control variables, this approach has many more predictors, and thus it will also have smaller degrees of freedom because we need more model parameters to account for those additional predictors. The consequence of this is that we will need a larger sample to achieve the same power when we use the multivariate approach compared to when we use the linear mix model approach. So of course, if there is an assumption, we will have a test to check for violations of that assumption. And in this case, that test is called Mockley's test of sphericity. It is regurgitated by SPSS as part of the default output for repeated measures analyses. And here we see that output. So the null hypothesis being tested here is that sphericity holds. So if we see a significant p-value for this test, that means there is evidence that the assumption of sphericity is violated. So looking at the output here, we do see a significant p-value. So there is evidence that the assumption of sphericity is violated. And maybe that is because of the qualitative difference between pre- and post-deployment measurements, right? For example, you could imagine that people before deployment vary a lot on how depressed they are, but when they are deployed, everybody becomes a lot more depressed, so the variance decreases. And then we also see a couple of columns labeled epsilon. So epsilon is an estimate of how much these data depart from sphericity. If sphericity holds, then epsilon will be equal to one. And the lower the value of epsilon is, the larger the deviation from sphericity is. So the worse the violation of this assumption appears to be. There is a lower bound to the epsilon, so this is the lowest value that it could possibly have, and that is simply calculated as 1 divided by the number of measurements minus 1. So in this case we have 4 measurement occasions, minus 1 is 3, 
So the lower bound of epsilon is one divided by three or one third. And that's indeed what we see here. But we also see two other estimates of epsilon, greenhouse geyser and Hahnfeld. And those are both actually really close to one. So it looks to me like sphericity might not be violated in a really bad way here. Just like with any assumption, you don't have to blindly adjust your analysis approach based on assumption checks. But you should always check assumptions. And if an assumption is violated, you should always disclose that. And you can either decide to use a test that is more robust to violation of sphericity, for example, the multivariate approach, or you could report both and discuss any differences between the results. So for these two different approaches, we can get some results. So the first approach, the univariate approach, will give us a linear mixed model. And here are the results for such a mixed model. So notice that the main effect we get is the effect of time. There are four measurement occasions, so there are three degrees of freedom for the effect of time. And note that we see four rows of output. So the first row gives us the output of the test if we just assume sphericity. And then we see a F value of 7.28, which is significant. So if we assume sphericity, there is a significant effect of time. And then we see three more rows that give us the same effect, but corrected for the violation of assumptions. So the worst thing that could happen is the lower bound of the violation of sphericity. And even with the lower bound, we still get a significant effect for the effect of time. But notice that the degrees of freedom have been substantially adjusted, which makes it harder to find a significant effect. And between the lower bound and sphericity assumed are the greenhouse geyser correction and the Hahnfeld correction. And those are less strongly corrected. So remember that I already showed you that both of the estimates of epsilon were pretty close to one. So the correction for the effect is very small. We went from three degrees of freedom to 2.9 for greenhouse geyser and 2.91 for Hahnfeld. And the resulting significant values are not really noticeably different from the one that assumes sphericity. Notice, by the way, that when we look at the error degrees of freedom, we see 2,931 error degrees of freedom. That means that every participant was counted multiple times, right? So these data are in long format. So again, if you don't want to assume sphericity, you can use one of the corrected tests. But there's always a trade-off between the type 1 error and the type 2 error. So if you use a stricter test, you decrease the risk of making false positive conclusions, but that also implies that you increase the risk of false negative conclusions, so missing a true effect. And the trade-off for these different methods is as follows. Assuming sphericity will result in the highest risk of type 1 errors and therefore also the lowest risk of type 2 errors. Conversely, the lower bound will give you the lowest risk of type 1 errors, but therefore also the highest risk of type 2 errors, so the highest risk of missing a true effect. And both Hahnfeld and Greenhouse Geyser give you slightly lower risk of type 1 error and therefore a slightly higher risk of type 2 error. Like I said, we don't have to use the linear mixed model approach. We can also use the multivariate approach, which controls for the scores at different time points. And to get those results, we can look at a table of multivariate tests. And again, we get several different tests for the same effect. So here's the effect of time. And for example, see that Pillai's trace gives us a value of 0.02 with an F value of 7.08, three degrees of freedom for the effect and 975 error degrees of freedom, which gives us a significant result again. So the same conclusion as with the univariate approach, which is reassuring, but notice that the error degrees of freedom are much lower, which again is because here we don't have the data in long format, we have them in wide format and we're controlling for people's score at different time points. And lower error degrees of freedom means that we will have less power to detect the true effect. But in this case, it doesn't matter. The effect is so big that it's still significant. Now, until this point, we've only looked at analyses where the main effect of interest is the effect of time. But we may also want to include control variables. To do this, we use what is called a mixed design. 
In a mixed design, we have a within participants factor, so that could be the effect of time or the effect of experimental condition, etc. In our current example with the deployment data, that is the effect of time. But there can also be between participants factors, for example, participants biological sex, participants age, participants major, etc. So in our example, a between participants factor could be whether or not that participant was exposed to high intensity combat action, one, or not. So the between participants factor here is a dummy variable. So if we look at some sample data, we notice that this is essentially a factorial design, where we have one factor with four levels, that's time, and one factor with two levels, that's combat exposure, low versus high. So we can make a table for all possible combinations of this factorial design. So there are one, two, three, four time points and one, two levels of exposure. And then we see that these are the mean values on depression for those combinations of the two factors, right? So it's a four by two factorial design. So there are eight cell means. But of course it's possible that the effect of time differs between the people who saw high intensity combat and the people who didn't. So we have to account for potential interactions between the two factors. And if we see a significant interaction, then we could use simple effects analysis to test whether the within participants factor time has an effect for each level of the between participants factor. But similarly, we could check whether the between participants factor has an effect at each time point of the within participants factor. So first, let's just visualize our data in a means plot with on the x-axis the effect of time. They are sorted, so it goes from time one to time four. And on the y-axis, people's depression score, and we have different colors for the two between participants levels, which is low exposure in yellow and high exposure in purple. So it looks to me like people who saw low exposure to combat action had consistently low scores on depression, and people who saw high exposure experienced an increase in depression. So because these lines are not parallel, I do expect that we will find an interaction between time and exposure. Again, if we use the linear mix model output, we get this test of within subjects design, and notice that now we see an effect of time and an interaction between time and exposure. So to know if there is a significant interaction, the first thing we look at is the significance of that interaction. Let's just assume sphericity and look at this p-value. And indeed, there is a significant interaction, which means that the effect of time differs depending on how much combat action our veterans saw. So because there is a significant interaction, we can perform simple effects tests. We can also use the multivariate approach to look at the simple effect of time. And then we get multivariate effects for the effect of time in the low group and in the high group separately. So we can see here, just looking at Pelias trace, for example, that there is no significant effect of time in the low combat exposure group, whereas there is a significant effect of time in the high combat exposure group. But we can also look at the simple effect of exposure for each time point separately. And what we see then is that there is a significant difference between the two exposure groups at each of the four time points. So depending on which of those variables is your primary variable of interest, you may choose to look at either of these two output tables to get your results. So in this case, I think time is the main effect of interest and exposure modifies the effect of time. So I would be most inclined to look at this output table and my main conclusion would be there is no significant effect of time on depression for the low exposure group, but there is a significant effect for the high exposure group. Notice that we have been doing a lot of post hoc tests, a lot of significant tests on the same sample. So we could decide to set a lower alpha level, for example, by applying Bonferroni's correction. In this case, it's not going to matter because all of the p-values are extremely small. They're all smaller than 0.001. But in many other cases, that may differ. So you could choose a more conservative alpha level if you want to defend against inflated type 1 error risk. 
That's all you need to know for this course on how to analyze repeated measures data using the paired samples t-test or repeated measures ANOVA. You'll get lots more practice with this during the tutorial, but also remember that there are more advanced techniques for analyzing repeated measures data, particularly in the field of structural equation modeling, and you can follow elective courses to learn more about those techniques. That brings us to the end of our time together. I hope you found these lectures valuable and may return to them at some point in the future, for example, when you're conducting your thesis research. It's been a pleasure teaching you. I hope you found something of value in these lectures and best of luck in the rest of your studies.